And then, you know, that's the thing that I was hit with to begin with. It's like, why can't the mean professor just play nice? So like, okay, all right. So we, we think about that for a bit. Okay, so there's a bunch of propositions that underlie that claim. The first is that using someone's pronoun is a mark of respect. That's not true. Now, it took me a while to formulate this because if someone comes up to you on the street and says, why do you use pronouns? It's like, you're taken aback. How the hell do you know? Why do you use he and she? Because everyone does. And, and that's how language works, right? You do what everyone else does. That's Otherwise, your language wouldn't be comprehensible. So why do we use he and she? Turns out I actually don't know. Not, not, in a, not at a deep level, so it took me like three weeks to think this through. First of all, my referring to you as he has zero to do with respect. It is the most um, perfunctory and casual form of classification possible. It seems to be predicated on the idea that indicating someone's sex is a fundamental necessity, because otherwise it wouldn't have become instantiated in the language. But there's four billion he's and four billion she's. And so when I refer to you as he, I'm referring you to a member, as, referring to you as a member of a very large herd. It has nothing to do with respect. It's just casual classification. And it's basically pragmatic in its, in its orientation. And so the idea that when I call someone he or she, it's a mark of respect, that's not true. The next issue is, well, what if someone wants to be called something different than what everyone else wants to be called? Um, not my problem. And first of all, if I'm going to interact with you casually, you can't impose a restriction on how I'm going to do that. Why would I bother even interacting with you then? There's, a, there's, there's billions of people out there that I could hypothetically interact with, and I don't see that you have any right whatsoever to demand from me any particular type of linguistic uh, uh, preferential treatment. And you certainly have no right to demand from me your, my respect. I don't know if you're respectable. And if you're a left-wing ideologue, the probability that you're respectable is zero. So, and then, then there's another issue here. It's, well, what about, yeah, but you're, you're treading on my identity. And in the legislation, this is another pernicious element of the legislation, a very, very, very dangerous presupposition. The idea is that identity, well, we'll say gender identity to begin with, but the larger issue is identity, because gender identity is an element of identity. So I'm just going to talk about identity. The legislation insists that your identity is subjectively defined, and only subjectively defined. It's subjectively defined to the point where it can be divorced from any underlying biological or objective reality, and it's subjectively defined to the point where it can be entirely mutable. So you can be a boy one, one day and a girl the next, or a boy one hour and a girl the next. In, in fact, I know that some people have taken to wearing bracelets so that their friends can tell whether they're female or male that day. And, you know, then I thought about identity. It's like, wait, wait a minute. Psychologists have studied identity for a very long time. Identity isn't defined subjectively. That's an insane proposition. So, so here's what identity is, roughly speaking. There's, there's your conception of yourself. That's not your identity. That's your theory about your identity, actually. So, but we'll leave that aside just for a moment. We'll focus on identity. Well, your subjective sense of who you are is only a tiny fragment of your identity. Your identity is a negotiated construct. It's, it's who you present yourself as, but it's also who other people have agreed that you are. And if you're a civilized person, you negotiate that. So, you know, your, your family, for example, has different opinions about your identity than you do, and that often causes a substantial amount of conflict. But that doesn't make you right and them wrong. Like, if they think you're being an annoying son of a bitch, they might tell you that, and it's possible that you are, even though your self-concept might not include that. And then, so there's the... There's the interpersonally negotiated element of identity, which is, which, is, which, which is paramount to its existence. But then there's something that's even more fundamental, more associated, I would say, with objective reality, which is that if you have a functional identity, it's a vehicle in which you travel through life. So, for example, if you're a father, 
which, which is part of identity, let's say, then you play a particular kind of social, uh, uh, you, you have a particular sort of interpersonal and social purpose. Like it's a practical, it's practical machinery. If you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a professor, if you're a baker, those are all parts of your identity. And those are parts of the toolkit. They're parts of the toolkit that you use to interact with the natural and the social world. And so the idea that your identity is your subjective whim, that no one else has anything to do with it, that no one else has a right to comment on it, that it's completely divorced from biology and objective reality is, it's, it's, it is, and I'm speaking as a psychologist here. It's the philosophy of a poorly socialized two-year-old. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because two-year-olds are egocentric. They don't know how to play with other kids yet. Even three-year-olds have trouble with that. But between two and four, there's a developmental shift. Um, and two-year-olds who are fundamentally egocentric learn how to expand their circle of comprehension so they can take other people's viewpoints into account. And then they can start to play shared games. And when you can play shared games with others, well, then the roles that you play in those games are defined by you and others in negotiation, and then you're acceptable to your peers. You can start being socialized by your peers and you can enter general society. So most people learn that identity is not subjective between the ages of two and four. And the evidence also suggests very strongly that if you don't learn that by the time you're four, you'll never learn it ever again in your entire life because you get thrown outside the peer groups and then you don't get socialized properly. So, so no, it's not a mark of respect for me to use your damn pronoun. It's a mark of your massive and massive narcissistic power grabbing to insist and then put the full force of legislation behind the demand that I call you anything you want. And that doesn't even touch on the potential multiplication of identities far beyond they into this insane proliferation of gender identities, which is up to about 70 now, I believe, on Facebook. And then, or, and that has, that means we haven't even started to talk about the insane problems posed by people like other kins who claim non-human identity. And if identity is only subjective, it's like, well, who are you to say? Maybe I'm an elf. Maybe I'm a fairy. Maybe I'm a puppy dog. Maybe I'm a bear. And I'm using those, those particular appellations because there are groups who are claiming exactly that and you say well that's just make-believe and they say you have absolutely no right to say that it's like well if there's no grounding underneath identity then it's whatever you want it to be well that's it's almost impossible to enumerate the number of ways that's wrong and it's dangerously wrong apart from being totalitarian i have to address you the way you want to be addressed. Really, I do, do I? No, how about no? To hell with you, I'm not doing that. It has nothing to do with whether you're transsexual. I could care less whether you're transsexual, as long as you're not particularly annoying. And that's the same way I feel about everyone else. It's like, do whatever you want. I'm pretty libertarian in that regard. But don't take your identity. You don't have any right to impose your identity on other people to the point where your arguments pose a threat to the fundamental structures of Western civilization. It's like you're pushing your luck a little bit there.